So uh, I muted a lot of people when they were coming into the meeting because they're getting kind of noisy. So somewhere on the line, can you confirm that A, you can hear me clearly, and B, can you say something to make sure we can hear you clearly? Leif, maybe? Anyone? Can anybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, you sound good. Nice. All right, you can hear us. I've got yep, it. Yep. And you can see the screen. Perfect. Oh, you guys are clear too. If you, have any, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Who are you? Who are you? Um, all right, so welcome to our second official dealer fire specific sneaks and releases, heavy emphasis on releases. Um, so I guess that's something I'll talk about right away. Uh, these meetings have kind of um, evolved over time. Um, it used to be more sneak and releases, and we talk about what's coming, like in the next, include up to and including next two to three months. Um, so what we're trying to do now, more consciously, is not talk about things that aren't almost certainly done, because the last thing we want is for you guys to talk to a dealer and say, "Hey, this is going to be done next week. It's going to save your life," and then for us to have a setback. So a great example of that would be something like the Texas price rules. I think a few of you are probably aware um, of that, or several acutely. Um, we had planned to launch, several people had kind of learned it was going to launch, um, and then we had some setbacks, right? And so we hadn't officially launched yet, but some dealers are already counting on it. Once they know we're supposed to build it, they feel entitled to it, even though they're not paying for the development. So now that it's not there, there are several dealers that are on us about where is it at, blah, blah, blah. So these meetings are, while called sneak and release, are more release, but these are things we're confident in that are going to be released within the next sprint. Um, maybe two or things that are already released, and I'd like to even focus more on the things that are already released uh, released um, recently. Um, so other than that, I kind of will hand it off to the specific PMs. I do have a couple of things in case people in the room didn't know. So we did uh, independent, we're doing independent packages. I think most people are probably aware, um, but you may not know. So like for the, the light um, dealer for a light package, which is $299, uh, we have we're kind of themes that we're sticking to in production since we're charging less we want it to be a more streamlined approach on the build so if you go to light one dot dealer fire you can see there's three options for the light dealers um so you go light one two three the second package is called pro so you can just go to pro one two three four five there's currently five options that's something that's new um, by request we built two more options to satisfy our previous commitments so dealers weren't getting upset when they we were telling them there's five options and there's only three at the time. Um, there are more to come. Uh, for, I think so. And you should have integration files. If they're not there already, I think he did. Jesse did QA with John or Michael, right? Michael? Yeah. Oh, there. I knew one of you in here. So uh, he used your department for QA integration files out there, or no? Yeah. Right. Good. Yeah. So those are good to go. Um, this is all last week that I was out of town, so I didn't keep up with it. Um, so yeah, light one, two, three, pro one, two, three, four, and then the same thing with all the OEM teams that we're doing, bw.dealerfire, scion.dealerfire, kia.dealerfire, scion one, or remove the one. Jaguar. Yeah, maybe. Okay, so anyway, take a guess at those. So generally, um, you'll, you'll be able to predict if you need to show off one of those things or check for functionality or whatever. That's you change the nomenclature. So it wasn't sitting on a, a dev 276 and you had no freaking clue. Um, so I think we also, we should be taking the password off of all of those. So for AM, if you need to demo or, or do a check or anybody else here needs to use those or pass them off, um, I don't see a reason why we can't have those out there for uh, people just to see as necessary. Other than that, I think we're good to go. And the last time we did this, we kind of done a recap of the last three months worth of work, whereas this is actually a month, a month work. So it's not going to be as... Um, kind of robust or as full as the last one. 
Uh, we're also not talking about everything that we've done. There's a ton of minute little changes that we make over time that it just wouldn't be worth our time to talk to you on, whether it's just a small technical task or an upgrade or a bug fix. Or, so this is not a sprint review where we kind of regurgitate every single thing that we've done. These are just a cherry pick, um, kind of best in our minds, things that we want to show or the things that we thought would be most impactful for the room uh, here. So that's kind of the, just to set the expectation a little bit. That's the purpose and the intent of the meeting. Um, questions throughout any of it, feel free to ask. Um, and obviously throughout full time, come, come to us with ideas or, or questions or issues that you have. I think right now we're running a little bit more, I guess you guys do a pretty good job of staying in contact with people, but um, we don't want to be rogue and in the vacuum making changes and new features based on what we think without talking to this team specifically or these the people on this um, this exact call. So with that, I think I will jump into the actual presentation that the uh, PMs put together. I'll drive if you sure. like, and you can use that first. All right, so I <coughs> kind of overviewed and planned. Let's hop into the actual releases. So Genevieve is up first. Or Genevieve, you're probably going to want to step closer or be very loud and clear since you're a little ways away from the mic. Yeah, you want to take a seat. So those are now Genevieve, product manager, analytics, heavy expertise, but currently owns the Ignite um, product and some, well, yeah, Ignite products are now, and uh, including the Ignite mobile app. Anything I'm missing on that? Is there, do you right? So, perfect. Um, and as Aaron mentioned, we're just going to go over some of the top things that impact you guys. Um, over the last couple of sprints, over the past month, the Ignite team has had heavy focus on switching the CDN from or two uh, some web services. So we've been moving all of our content into images, staff images, all of that fun stuff over. So there's just a few things I wanted to quickly touch on with you guys. And on the first slide is going to be our Google Analytics view ID that we've added. And I know some of you have added the UA code within Ignite. So when you mark a primary in there, this new field pops up. Um, the analytics team is actually going to handle all that filling in, so outside of that team, no one really needs to worry about it. But essentially, the reason that was added is because in Google Analytics, separate accounts, each account could have dozens of separate views. So if they decided to add a filter, they could create a separate view to add that filter to and whatnot. So the issue that creates is by default, right now we're grabbing the newest view. And what that means is our, our um, Ignite features. So our analytics dashboards, as well as our OEM feed information that we're sending out, could be pulling something that's filtering out most of the data. So we're adding this in to make sure we're reporting on the best analytics account. But again, that's going to be managed by the analytics team, and they're already kind of getting underway and filling that in. The next feature. Does anybody have any questions about this one? I know I have a question. It's not filled out. It's not filled out. So it would just show what a primary. So it doesn't automatically go in, it will manually enter those. So by default, it's just going to go for the newest UID, which most accounts only have one anyway. So it works just how it's been working. But if we type in something there, it's going to override. So can anybody tell me why we want, why we need a UID in addition to a tracking code? All right, so that's something we want to establish. So you should be asking these questions, people in the room and on the phone. Um, who wants to explain it? So this is a requirement that kind of came from analytics. So this is, again, hopefully, um, or it came from the analytics team and their research. So again, hopefully we're taking ideas from you and implementing it. So Lauren, why don't you give us an overview uh, of why we're doing view ID? I think Danny kind of touched on a lot of it, because like sometimes we'll set up a view view one, which is testing your filter, testing something for the site, and then just pulling data and like the right that they want to go down. Yeah, so more specifically, so people in the room understand, I think what really kicked this off more than anything, you guys remember the referral spam that was showing up in analytics, all the weird porn names that were popping up? So 
Uh, I don't have a specific example, so everyone understands the use case. So, go ahead and read that on the demo. So, um, what happens is analytics works just by anytime something opens the site, it triggers that view. So, that we can't control who opens the site or what opens the site or what data comes in there. So, what's happening is these companies were spamming the referral fields by having um, bots go from their site to our site, so then their URL would show up on analytics. The hope is that they did this to a ton of sites at a time, that people then go, what is the site for traffic? And they click on that site, and they get a bunch more traffic, right? So there's no way to really filter that out proactively because they just create a new site. So we could, we could do it one site at a time, but then for infinity, they just create a new site and do the same thing on that site filter it out. So not feasible to filter every single thing out. So there's two options, right? We can just filter out all the bad stuff one by one, not feasible, or we can filter it to only show the good stuff. So how we do that is by host name. And so we can say, okay, here's one or two or three of the predictable host names we have, one of which being the domain itself. The problem is not all good host names are going to fall under those ones that we pick. There are valid host names that are other than predictable ones. So by filtering out, filtering to only show the good traffic that we know is good traffic, we could be filtering out additional valid traffic, right? And by filtering only, the, trying to filter only the bad, new ones are going to pop in. So there's no perfect way to do it. So instead of filtering anything from the main view, we filter up, only filter in what we assume is good traffic using the view ID, but allow the main UA code to take in all that data. So if it ever becomes an issue, that traffic seems to drop below what we'd expect. It may be because the host name that we didn't uh, count on is actually coming in. So we can go back to the full analytics that shows all the traffic and then see that, okay, we do need to add this host name, whereas we wouldn't be able to see it otherwise. So it's actually a pretty tangible or like useful thing that we need to use that will affect the outcomes and the success of our, our dealers, right, and the perceived success. So I just want people to get that there is that there is purpose behind these things, and it's not just a crazy little analytics thing that only they need to worry about. It's bigger than that. Make sense? Well, it's pretty predictable. So there's like several main host names that come in general on the web, right? It's like the main ISP type providers, and then the actual domain of the site becomes a host name. So that's how you generally decide, but that's the problem. So a new ISP comes on, or somebody's doing some sort of um, either proxy or routing or whatever. There's a million different reasons why the host name. Not known. There's a few reasons why a host name would differ from what you'd expect. So that's again why we can't do it globally. So that's how that, why and how that happens. Not the hijacking happen. This didn't happen. Forget that we ever did this. Um, the next one, as I touched on last time we talked, is the Ignite app underway. And for those of you that weren't here or have no idea that we have an app, we have an app. Um, right now, its primary use is for inventory. We're looking to expand it beyond that. So we took a look at the analytics to see what people are predominantly using within the Ignite system in general, and especially what are people using Ignite and trying to access it for mobile devices, and trying to work those slowly into the app. So inventory is in there. Our next step was leads as the next most popular. <laughs> Right now, you'll see the basic leads showing up in the new version of the app. I only have an Android, so I'm not sure if it's live on iOS right now. Um, it's all supposed to go live by next week. Um, but you'll see on the left side, this is your basic overview. You see that from there, you can click on the lead and expand in and be able to reply to email or anything like that. So we'll be able to see those lead details. The so lead details, they're finishing up the Android side. iOS is already set to go, and they're going to push all of that live, I believe, next Tuesday. Good. Next one is another widget we're throwing in there. This one is a revamp of the existing visitors overview. And I know a lot of you, especially the account managers, have been, have been having questions from clients why we don't have unique visitors or users information broken out in there. We've been trying to revamp that one and make it a little bit more visual. So this one will include sessions, users, bounce rate, page views, pages per session, and average session duration, which again was already part of that visitors overview. What we've done this time is expanded out like those 
Um, are there seven new widgets that we showed you last time? So they'll have an option of how they want to view that data within the widget. So they'll have a table, a line graph, or the metric option, and I'll screenshot those in a second. Um, one thing I want to point out for this, and I've already discussed it with the analytics team, um, so they'll be sitting down with each of the account managers and as well as talking to support to make sure everybody's on the same page with this. Thanks, Russ. Um, <laughs> So you're going to see that user count, that unique visitor, is not going to look the same in our widget as if they look in Google Analytics. So I want to explain quick why that is and why we've decided to go ahead and push this live. So basically, you know, a, a user versus a session, essentially. So when you have those sessions on your site, that's every time somebody goes to your site. So if I went to your website three times, I have three sessions, but I'm one user. So the way Google looks at it is over the date range that you select, they're picking out how many times you have a unique user in that 30 days to come to the site. Now the way we pull the information is one day at a time and we store it in order to pull it into these Ignite widgets. So when we calculate this, we're looking at uh, for the month of November, how many users do we have? What we do is we do November 1st, November 2nd, November 3rd, and we add the unique users together to get that total count. But what Google does is looks at the month as a whole. So we're going to have a slight discrepancy. We shouldn't see a huge difference in the data, and we're working on trying to find ways around that. But right now, that's, that's the whole reason why we've had difficulties with our reporting tools as well. Third parties can't access Google Analytics API to get that information exactly how Google pulls it. So we'd still like to go forward with displaying, but we are going to add a disclaimer to the widget and just say, here is how we calculate users over time. So and we will inflate the number of users. Right. Yes. So important to note because at some point a dealer is or probably has or will look at analytics, look at our analytics and go, you guys are inflating the number. Right. right. No, so that's why the, the disclaimer is important, but we all know dealers reading and attention, right? <laughs> they, they're very busy people, so they're probably not going to read the disclaimer. So you guys need to be immediately ready to go, oh yeah, we know why that's happening. This is the difference. Just be able to just explain that distinction because the, otherwise they'll think that we're uh, intentionally manipulating the data because we know other people in the past in our specific space have actually done that. So that's really good to know. So the next slide is just going to show you what that widget is going to look like. Um, on the far left is what the edit view is going to look like. You can choose which of all of those, or if all, you want to show all of those at once. And then, like I was saying, you have those three different display options. So you've got the metrics for one, the second is your table view, third line graph. Is that it? All right, that's analytics. Next up is Eric Giro. So his uh, Giro, for people who don't actually want to explain. Um, he works on the front end, right? So we call Engine 5, but it's really uh, the functionality and the features of the website themselves, the generally consumer facing um, features of the site. Can I mention something too? The widget is live next Tuesday. If you see it, it went live, it got taken down, it got taken down. What do you like from it? Yeah. The tracking widget, the, the analytics widget upgrades. Cool. So most of you were in this meeting last time, last month, we one of the products or one of the things that, one of the features that was released was a URL parameter that allowed you to see age the inventory. So you could add this, this URL parameter you see here to the any inventory page and substitute XX for some number, say 75, and show or see only inventory that was older than 75 days on top. And this is handy for uh, dealers because they often want to advertise age inventory, right? Uh, but then I leave mean, you as a request, John Borkart, uh, for being able to show inventory up to a certain amount of days old. So now, with a very similar URL parameter, you can add to the end of an inventory page, type in 30, and that's going to show you inventory that is less than 30 days old. So this could be handy for like new in stock type of widgets or information. Uh, so that's available. You can use it, set it up. 
Uh, good to go. Hopefully you guys like it and can use it. Uh, um, okay, here's another one that we've been trying to get to work for a long time. Took another crack at it, and um, I like the way that it works. Hopefully you will as well. So um, I'll click here so you can see. Um, this is a slideshow scaling versus cropping kind of thing. So we've had issues where, you know, if you have this really wide slide to look good on a website, as soon as you start scaling it down on a responsive site, it's just going to shrink everything. Well, that really sucks for when there's text on the slide and then the text gets super small. So now uh, we are cropping or we're, uh, we've given the availability, the option to crop what we call non-essential imagery. So that's everything outside of the center thousand pixels. So that will crop down until you get to the center thousand and then it'll scale that. Um, you can see how this works on this URL here. And if you'd like to try it out on your site, the configuration option is what is that here. This is likely something we'll want to default to. So the problem now is our, our slides on mobile are very almost unusable. They're, it's more like a, a visual cue than anything. You can't read the disclaimer. You the button text says sometimes the numbers are unreadable. So we will likely in the future default to this. Um, the only reason we can't now is because design isn't currently building the slides in this way. So this will. It's not just like take it right now our slides like he said. Take the whole thing and slowly makes it like this, which means it keeps the ratio. Which is super thin, yeah. This is actually going to take out some of the stuff, crop some of it out. So if you have an essential or something on the outside, it's gone. So this is probably the most of the to start using this design guide and it enables this in builder and just that way it'll start that. So this is an update from sort of what we had before. It was just built awkwardly before. I can do it. I didn't want to meet everybody because I wanted people to be able to ask questions. So I'm going to mute everybody on the line because we're getting some feedback. So if you have a question, unmute yourself um, before you do. Okay, bye. Uh, so that should be cool and should definitely help on smaller screen sizes because, as you know, you don't need that much white space on a lot of slides. So it's good to go. Uh, uh, so the existing one went away. I don't know if they overrode the old one. So but the, depends on how you get it. So this was how the first one was designed. These exact dimensions were what we wanted to do last time. Maybe it was 1,100, but I think we picked 1,000. Right. It just didn't actually do it that way. So if you've been building slides based on what the old one was supposed to do, it'll still work just fine. I think that's the default. Yeah. yeah, it'll just do it right this time. Whereas before, it actually it cropped, 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 and then when you got to I think the small, it uncropped and then just did a, a drop down to the same thing. So we actually lost it, the effect for the most part on mobile. Whereas this. We'll do all sizes. We'll do all the cropping and then do the image responses so it'll act natively. Try it out. If you find any problems, let us know. Yeah. Um, like, let me know. Uh, so, th this one's really cool. I'm really excited about this one. We have for a while um, tried to improve the way people type in numbers on forms on a mobile device. And it started with a phone number. We did phone number masking, and that was rolled out to a certain number of forms. And now we have a whole bunch of numerical entry improvements on mobile. So for every numerical field, whether it be zip code, phone number, social security number, mile, um, miles per gallon, whatever, you are no longer going to see a QWERTY keyboard on mobile. Amen, hallelujah, holla back. <laughs> and uh, another enhancement is the zip code validation. So now people can't enter anything but five digits, and that validation occurs in browser uh, before you uh, attempt to submit the form. Uh, 
So we can say if Canadians turn this off, or you can change the validation based on an if statement. Is what I'm trying to say. And so you don't have to override the form per se. You just write that in the, the head. I'm assuming, right, Daniel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I speak in shoes. He speaks in cans. So. Okay, it's good feedback. Um, yeah, well, and this isn't this isn't like loaded to every site. You have to go in and hit update FTP. Um, and so we'll have that. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, anyway, there you go. We'll follow up on that. Yeah. Good catch. Um, here's one requested from production. Um, it is. It allows you to customize the CSS for vehicle specifications on search results pages. So this is an example. You can see that. You know, the color is not the drivetrain or whatever, but it just shows you what it can look like. Uh, you can go in and style your text so that instead of having this block of text that says, you know, 1519 MPG, all wheel drive, whatever, you can make it look pretty. So, uh, Michael Dahlke actually uh, produced some nice release notes to help you uh, show you some examples CSS and how that can look. So uh, Jason is putting it into a tech doc, and that will be distributed. So that should be kind of fun and allow support and production to style SRPs a little prettier. I would suggest that if we're making consistent style changes to these modules that you tell us, and we'll just update it globally, because this is another one of those things where it just adds work to your plate if you're going to have to do the same stuff over and over. So. Yeah. Um, Similar, but we've had this conversation several times. Like, in yeah. research, I mean, it's an efficiency thing. So it gives you the ability to, but I would say if you find yourself doing the same thing site for site, we'll either add it to the clone, but even better, we'll do it in the module. That way, if at some point, VW just happens to have an MPG blow up and we have to change MPGs on all VW sites, we don't have to go in and actually check the, the user code right. on those. So we have to be careful. With this, that, all of those items. Didn't have a unique class name, right? So we couldn't target one specific. Yeah, I don't think we're going that's not going to make a particular. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, just yeah, keep in mind the trade-off, right? Yep. Right. Um, okay. So this is uh, probably the coolest one that I have to show. Uh, it was my featured sneak from last month, which is now live on a handful of sites. Uh, it's our new map module. It's an extension of the header geolocation module that shows that allows the user to have their location automatically detected and then show dealers close to them. So here's what that looks like. Um, on load, you'll see, well, I can just give a live demo here. Give me a sec. I'm gonna just to make it clickable in here. There you go. I think I'm gonna open and uh, hit up. There you go. Okay, uh, this is a live uh, tier two Honda site that we have. You'll notice that this site looks beautiful because I built everything that you can see here. <laughs> <laughs> you built it, really? Including, the, the, including uh, this offers module, which you should all be very well aware of now. This is awesome. And now, this fancy new map module. So here you can type in a zip. Let's do it. Um, what's the zip code up here? 54901. 
should have auto infected. Boom! Or you can auto detect. Um, and now we, we are seeing the dealerships which are closest to the location that was entered. Um, notice when you show more, you can get a little scroll bar so you can see all did that. Zoom out on the map when you did that to show all those stores. It did. It's awesome, isn't it? Good thinking. Um, and if I click a store, it's going to zoom in on that particular store and give me the contact information, allow me to get directions, or to visit the website specifically. So it's one of the coolest things to ever come out of uh, the product management plot. <laughs> Uh, and it's available for you to use. How does it look on mobile? Uh, how does it look on mobile, Aaron asks. Let me tell you, it looks awesome. Looks like that. Uh, we did look kind of cheated off of Google Maps to, to steal some of their kind of pin place marker. So what you'll have is the ability to change your location on mobile after you've already selected a location, and then when you um, Select one from the list, you'll jump into this view where it'll give you. Uh, could have just made the window small and show this. Can I? Well, I was afraid it wouldn't work. You have to reload it. But yeah, maybe not. There we go. Reload. Mm -hmm. That's working. Oh, well, there's some overlap on the bottom there. No, that's okay. Anyway, if you didn't really want to use those buttons, you get the pick. Best thing you ever created. Yep. So anybody wants to start a round of applause? Huh? <laughs> so specifically developed with tier two in mind. So yeah. Sam, you remember um, what's the group real world? So they asked for this a long time ago. We never even told them we were going to build it. Well, we Someone might have had it in say anything. So this is not exactly what they want, but we haven't even told them we have it. So this is one of those cool things that after maybe let it maybe test it a little little bit more, but you can go back to them and they. Well, yeah, they will love the fact that we have this available. It also, I was going to say, it also interacts with the header module. So, like, car right is using this. Yeah, so, like, if you in the up in the header where it's, like, find my location or find my dealer, when you do that, it's going to adjust the map automatically so that they were not with the one. Yeah, and they wanted the same, the way we could build this, this display is based on what they wanted out. Only shows the nearest dealer, shows the distance to the whatever. So we used their specs in addition to um, some of our ideas and some, uh, Omni Advertising, which is another big tier two group that we have in, um, to kind of build it. So it will, I think most tier twos will love it. Um, and then group you can site. use it on, exactly, that was my next, you can use it on grids, right? It, yeah, any group site that has a map might as well be using this map. Um, so there, I think, I, I think last thing we might remember kind of the next step for this whole geolocation thing is right now when you select a store, there's the ability to say, just show me the inventory at this store. And what we're going to do is allow a user to select a store and show inventory within a certain mile radius of that store. So if you select, hey, this is my store, you won't just see the inventory right at that lot because if there's three within 20 miles, the user would still want to see that as well. But before I turn it over to Kevin, I'd like to ask him and everybody else who's giggling, what the hell is going on on hip chat right now? Thank you, because I just texted these points. <laughs> Come on, spill the beans. People on the phone want to hear. At first, I thought I was it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, anyways, uh, any questions for me, let me know. Obviously, we uncovered one little bug, the Canadian zip code. That's good. Thank you, Corey. Great. Prove that why these meetings are valuable. Um, keep sending us your ideas. Kevin, tell me when to hit the next button. Can, can I actually hear you? I think, I'm guessing. I think the mic is picking up pretty well. We have some chats once you hit that. Oh, we got some chats. We are now fielding chats. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, Lance. I don't know who you're talking about. Real world. Certainly thing. nothing that uh, product did. <laughs> <laughs> Nope. 
Okay, so Kevin is our new OEM product manager. And he's got Nope. Okay, yeah, we're good. All right, so first thing. So the real reason we were laughing is because you guys have ever seen a dip chat um, emoticon for air caching? Um, mm. Try to look that up a little bit later. So. <laughs> Just all <laughs> in and it's all in. So OEM side of things for products, um, been about two weeks into this, so not a whole lot on the release side yet. A lot of the small side we're working on, but a few different releases and a lot of it. To be completely honest, we've been reporting the things for the brand side. But a couple things we've seen in JLR showroom, and showroom is just something we're working on globally right now, especially small our OEM programs. Uh, we created the hero images, uh, so those are at the top of the ML keys um, on the showroom. That will get rolled out in most of the showrooms that we have. And Eric talked a little bit more about um, the actual showroom showing the tile and the different models. So we're still redacting those a little bit, but this is kind of the first iteration. Other OEM releases, we just think that aren't as I guess, but they're still part of the program that we need. Key and new card incentive stage, so the ability to actually show new card incentives on all our key program sites. JLR certified pre owned offers, um, which is a grid that we have to create to show all the different financing rates for pre owned vehicles in the program uh, that's installed globally. And then what we felt recently is that Volkswagen is um, providing a lot of supplemental PPC dollars to their dealers. So just recently they gave November and December. I think it's $175 per sold car to every new user who needs a PPC to kind of help the TPI issue. So you're doing the same thing in 2016 for the, the top launch, they're just giving free money to do this uh, to do this with the food vendor, which we are. So we have to create a system for that. So that's been on the, on the releases. So a couple things on the sneak. This is really the first big thing um, I guess that I've been working on, and we've been going back and forth. Eric's been helping me out a lot in working with the group. You know, the other people. So, one of the biggest things in our OEM program that we get, um, kind of the, the competition against us, is the ability to show incentives and rebates on actual qualified inventory. So, our idea is if we're getting OEM incentives directly from the brand itself, consistently, monthly basis, in the same exact format, why not create a system that actually takes that information and drops it into special offers, which you get by like, knowing that you manage offers and the tile and air to you. And be able to actually display those offers on qualified invoices, right? To segment them. So the idea is to take those special offers and basically enable a module on an SRP that says for this specific qualified piece of inventory, there's manufacturer offers and the piece of finance. And then we're using the exact same uh, functionality from the special offers page to create a pop up on the SRP to show the disclaimer, to show when it expires, they can print it, they can do the CPA, they can do the inventory off of it. So we're kind of cannibalizing a previously installed or previously created module for increased functionality on actual inventory. It'll also show you that we're doing the same thing on the VET. So you see under there we have manufacturer offer. This is pretty much the same type of thing that Google.com does on their uh, Jaguar Land Rover sites. And it just gives us more flexibility in actually getting you know, dealers which always have issues with our incentives you know, using AIS, which in most programs you can't even use AIS. So this will allow us at least for the time being on just Jaguar Land Rover to show those on all the different inventory that new vehicle uh, on so the cool the cool thing here and what it's showing a progress of is we created this manage offers module to show you know the most common types of offers, lease and finance. But we don't want those offers to only live in that module. We want to show them where it makes the most sense to show them, which is on the qualifying inventory pages. So if somebody's viewing a car, we want to be able to say, hey, this car might actually have a better deal than you think. They're in the price tag shows. So we want to be able to advertise that offer everywhere that vehicle shows up and be able to control it all from one place. So that is the manage offer section in Ignite. And this is the first of many steps that we're taking to show that offer in the most relevant and helpful places for the customer. Uh, and the inventory pages obviously being probably the, the most important. So very cool, very excited about this one. I think everybody's gonna wanna use it. Unfortunately, right now it's still manual entry of those offers, but you, know, you can do that for your most attractive new model um, and eventually 
we're going to get incentives to, to pour into it. Well, we're starting to do this is especially on JLR because the shift people are actually entering in those offers. So, okay, right? so we basically don't have any operational <coughs> on that. So we're just taking the data that they give us, which is great on these programs, but they're setting it to what they have to. And that we can eventually, the only way to get about the team and shift, which is important. You know, the idea is going to love. Yeah, the idea is to continue to do more things like this, where things connect you out. So, for instance, why why wouldn't this information show up on the showroom? We're giving you all this model information. Right. The answer is it's going to at some point. But I do want to caveat this and everything you hear for. This is more of that sneak side of things. Right. So this is just it really, really is concepting this. Um, so we'll probably stray away from these. Um, but this is like don't tell anybody about this. Um, just know that. We, a lot of you have come to that we, we are aware that incentive is a weak spot, and so we're doing what we can to, to bridge the gap until we get it completely solved. But this is not even close to, there's been zero code written, to my knowledge, to even start to do this yet. So just be aware. Maybe three lines of code. Mm -hmm. I know. That's why. I yeah. Well, we're in the sneaks, okay, guys? We're sneaking here. We need to keep, the, keep them on hush. The sneaky sneaks. Um, uh, sold. <laughs> just, just more on the showroom layouts for related programs than you would have for JLR. We're not using these images. We're not using these images. They're fancier than this. Right. Yeah. But that way out. This is live, right? This is a sneak. It's actually not. Yeah. It's, not it's ready to go. Are you sure? Very, yeah. Really sure. Just checked Jaguar to do it. All right. Jaguar, I'm pretty sure I saw a lot. Check a lot. Not yet. People going to be. We can do that on the phone side. For current dealers, we can make the switch manually. Exactly. A lot of dealers have to go down. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, other OEMC, just a few things that are frame level. So, uh, JLR showroom, another showroom thing. Um, we found a lot of our showroom data that we were very specific in how we created content and metadata um, related to 2015, 2016. So, we're doing a meta update when we refresh the showroom pages to make it more, not necessarily uh, year agnostic, but more just new, so general, I guess you could say. So, we're doing an update there um, for the showroom. BW after sales, BW had this whole rollout program where they're doing all these service related and accessory and part related pages. So phase two all these done we're waiting on one page to be installed. All those pages go on place based off of uh, API essentially. So if the dealers enroll, we just drop out of their site. We don't have to create an And then 2016 BW showroom update. So all of our vehicles for the most part are optimized for 2015. So now that 2016 models are on a lot of work and I getting all that on. Um this is the last sneak. Last last slide. Um, you guys are all familiar with the Save Vehicles module. So if you hit the little Save button or the three and a half inch floppy disk icon on any of the uh, websites, you get a little thing in the bottom tray of your or a little tray at the bottom of your site that says Save, and you can then look at those vehicles, compare them, um, etc. So we are working on an enhancement to that module so that whenever a user visits a VDP, that little tray will pop up with all of the VDPs you viewed to show you your recently viewed vehicles. This would be similar to a items you recently looked at on Amazon kind of thing um, and should be pretty neat. Could you do that on a or a custom landing page for itself. So, like on a bottom vehicle, you may be interested in. Like they have an option to see how you could add that. I mean, like the one. Like, say, recently maybe recommended. Yeah, like recommended. That's another That's level. Cool. I, yeah. I would say that would be step for, I mean, after this. This is a different thing. So, just because they've looked at the Honda Accord. Uh, page is which trim mobile are they looking at? Which one? So how do you encapsulate that here? Because all this is this is only interacting with the inventory right now, strictly inventory. So there's not a good way to 
when we could, again, we could well, hopefully build logic out or come with smart modules will come out with it. Literally use that on the site in the recommended vehicles module. So two distinct differences. This is not recommended, and I don't think it ever probably will be, but there will be stuff surrounding this on the site, like, the, like on the BDP right now, the right rail. Um, there's like a six era of cars you might like. At one point, we did build it, so it was using things just like that. So engine six, and probably maybe a little bit before, we'll be able to use some more of that logic and crossfire for that matter. Um, we'll be able to use that data to better populate you may be interested in. So right now, those modules are written with, with set logic. You can say vehicles with $5,000 of the vehicle they're looking at right now, or vehicles, same, uh, same year, make, and model of the vehicle they're looking at, or whatever. But yeah, over time, we want to override that with show vehicles that we, they've shown interest in uh, and of themselves, including what they've saved, including based on tags or keywords that we know the other content they've looked at, including what they're driving now with Crossfire. So yeah, we, we do want to make things a lot more intelligent, and this, that would be something we, and over time, can do. And we could, for instead of adding what you may be interested in here, we could make what you may be interested in look at this and maybe populate with that, right? One of the things that you know, this week was the guy wanted, you know, like, the vehicles that he had recently used to show up on his home page, mm -hmm. the one someone visited. The first one was, yeah, the first one issue, and this is called that. that. Yeah. So yeah. this can be on the home page, so theoretically, when it, it came will back, be. yeah. It, whenever you view a VDP, just like a saved vehicle thing, that it'll show up in that little tray. Well, the pen, and it'll follow you throughout. The depends on how the module's installed. Because the module does not have to be installed in the home page. Okay. Uh, recency. So the top one will be the most recent one that you've looked at. Well, if they're more engaged with it, then they probably would have viewed it more recently. This so it would something. continue to resurface. I don't know. Regardless, we'll have something like that. I think <laughs> recency is going to be the best, though, just because, like, if you think my shopping behavior, right? I, 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 like Auto Trader, I probably looked at a car, like a whatever a car I was looking at three months ago or a couple weeks ago. I thought I was going to do it, and then I was like, last minute, said, no, you know, that's not the direction I want to go. It'd be annoying for me. To, for me to have to override that, so that's the way. You know, the, the, the other thing is the best measure of what people are interested in. People will be able to pluck vehicles directly from the recent tab and save them. So, like as a favorite, basically. So, if you've looked at 15 over the course of three sessions, you can hit those and put them on your save list, so you have like your favorite. List. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. It should just eliminate from the module itself. We'll have to check, yeah. but I'm, I'm going to go 99% sure that it just drops out because it's just querying inventory. If it's not there, the stop number's gone. It's just gone. Um, is it going to be an alternative to do? But it should say so. Uh, this one, like maybe install it to put it in the module. I missed what you think we were talking about. Was the and you said instead of doing like this saved recent. Tab like little bar, he's saying like a, a strip or like, like, yeah, like, like Amazon does, that's what does. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. 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 Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, like, on the, on the yeah. BDP now, we could just port this into there and say instead of showing related vehicles based on the parameters that we set, we could just say show vehicles that this one looks like. Right, but I was talking about so if we have to go over the entire site, like that, we can like you know, order it and it looks like yeah. a yeah. 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 You can play it. Vehicles modules are mobile, right? There's always one we can. Yeah. I mean, there's some. So, well, it's a skyline. Yeah, exactly. So, functionality first, so I'll build it out. And then I think that's a good idea. I like that shopping experience too, where like you look at these vehicles and it shows you yeah, where you go. Right. So, um, I think we can, build, we can build future iterations of the interface later. Uh, and then the last thing we had was just if Aaron has any updates on Crossfire or no. We're in, we're in pilot. I did a pretty a demo last time, I guess. Um, Pardon me says I should do it again, but I'm going to hold off. If you do want a demo, hit me up. I'll do one um, for you. But we have five to six dealers in pilot. Um, I've demoed three other dealers this week alone. So we're trying to get more in there. This will, um, Crossfire will most likely launch before a digital dealer. Um, go public digital dealers uh, like January 17th, maybe. So we're only about a month off from, from pushing it live. So, um, 
<laughs> it's a game. Yeah. <laughs> it's a movie and a game. Um, yeah, a lot of dealers are pretty excited about it. The last two that I talked to on the phone were actually newer web clients. And they said they just signed up with the website recently because they heard of Crossfire and they just got on. So I thought it was uh, pretty good to hear. I think this will be pretty awesome. And then again, it'll connect into all those things we just talked about. So again, related vehicles could be looking at what well, they're driving a van now or whatever. They, they tend to, they bought three vans, so let's show them more vans instead of just guessing what they might be interested in. Um, or personalizing the home page, all those things that we talked about will down the road be enabled by um, this type of engine. But for now, all it does is to remind people, matches customers across CRM website, gives a notification in the CRM when someone browses uh, the website, and then they can then um, see what the people are. They can then see uh, what, the, what the people did on the website and then email them or whatever, follow up with more context. So anyway, I think that is the uh, the full set of functionality to be coming out shortly. Um, if you have any, unmute uh, yourself now and all our yeah. Any questions on the phone? Anything in the room? Any quick ideas you want to throw off the people while we have them all in the same place? Anyway, nothing. Mueller. You guys are so interactive. <laughs> Love it. Oh. Um, Thanks for coming. This is awesome to see this many people here. So last week we had like seven people. I think a lot of people were traveling. But anyway, I think we have most of the AM team on the line as well. So I wanted to wait until we had this kind of format dialed in before we started to expand it. But I think more and more we'll start to allow more people to listen in on these and get excited about what we're working on. Is this a valid agency? Is this like we should keep doing these once a month? It's just helpful for people. Yeah. All right. Well, and, and it's when we start doing these with more regularity, um, you know, maybe bring bring questions or ideas to to the meeting. You know, if you want to go over some new ideas. Yeah, this so, is meant for us to present to you, but I would love at the end of it and during it, obviously, to make it like an idea session or yeah, things that you think you need because this only happens once a month. Once a month, but we can use the feedback here to change timelines or add new things to our sprints and to our cycles. Development cycle. Oh, Paul, I've got a question. There you go. What is geofencing? What is it? Could you explain to me what it is you mean? Oh, I can't help you. <laughs> well, we talked about this last time, though. Crossfire is the answer. I know. I was going to say like, that's like, yeah. He was born in '98, so it makes sense. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So no plans to do GL fencing now. Genevieve, we, and the three of us, to talk about pre-crossfire. There is the opportunity for us to maybe write some website rules based on what we know about those people just on the website without crossfire. Um, I just it's just not currently in the in the plans. I think right now, from a sales perspective. Um, I would just come back with what we talked about last time. What are you actually using for? What is the conversion? What is the success rate? So right now, the one company that we know that does it says, if someone's in a given area, then we change this small piece on the website. So what the, the best way to sell it is if someone's in a competing dealership and then they happen to come to your website while they're at that dealership, you could have a unique something on your site about why they should shop at your store other than the dealership. But they've already gone to your website, so they already know they want to cross shop you. So what are you doing? And the, the answer to the dealer is, what, do you, what is geofencing doing? It's allowing you to show more personalized data on your website based on something the user has done or something about them. Would you rather determine what that data is based on where they're at or where their phone says they might be, or based on the car they own, whether they're in equity, how many family members they have, you know, where their home address is. We're, our Crossfire provides the ability to customize the website experience to the 10th degree more than a geofencing solution could. So geofencing is like a poor man's version of what we are piloting now. And especially because it's in pilot now and is releasing a digital dealer, we're there now. Like you can you can start using that as your answer to geofencing. And it is better. But, but keep in mind those modules may take a while to be built. 
Right. So right. that's why yeah. in the meantime. Yeah. Exactly. So and I think we will over no, time. We'll probably build in the rest of that the functionality to be able to do the personalization without CRM. So again, we know we can look at their past browsing experience and make some assumptions. We can look at <laughs> um, so we, we probably will build it in at some point. It's just not on the radar. So in the meantime, question the, the point of it, right? There's a million features that other people have that just aren't useful, and it's just a, a shiny little thing to get you make the sale. So it's, our, it's your job, especially your job at this point, to understand what's the purpose. So the purpose of everything we should do should be to actually help sell more cars, right? But again, if that the only way that works is because it's not active talking so like text you and says, don't shop at this dealer, but shop at ours. They have to have come to your website. So your other marketing outside of this application have to have already have worked for them to even see the message that you're getting. So once you're there, what are those six words going to be that just change your mind about shopping at the dealership that you're sitting in at that given moment? It's not going to. Your pricing, your availability, your inventory are going to do those things. It's not going to be a don't shop at that store because they lie or we're 1% cheaper on average. You know what I mean? It's like a Wi-Fi enabled pressure <laughs> you don't buy it because it has Wi-Fi. There's an intent behind the pressure cooker. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. It's cheeky bought a Wi-Fi and have a pressure cooker. It's not 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 a pressure cooker.